Well, no one's going to be able to escape my flowchart. <laughs> flowchart time. Here's our first box. Is quantum mechanics wrong? <laughs> no. <laughs> could be wrong. Could just be the wrong theory. Well, you could say yes. And now you've got a research project on your hands. <laughs> We're going to put that aside because... Where's the fun of that? I mean, I don't have a talk to give anymore. Okay, well, let's say no. What if we answer that question, no? Well, okay, quantum mechanics is wrong, so now we have to do something. To do something. Uh, well, so the first question we can ask is, did the quantum state of the box collapse? Wait a minute, of the box or of the system? Contents of the box. Oh, okay. Rigor, okay. The contents of the box. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm saying the contents of the box did it collapse. Okay, well, we got two options. Yes, it collapsed. But if it collapsed, now we have to uh, answer, well, what, you know, what if the Wigner's friend were uh, a marmot or or uh, um, uh, uh, you know one of those ant lions, or uh, or a tardigrade, or uh, uh, a single cellular organism, or a virus, like a, 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 an electron. Like a, do they all collapse things? We don't think they all collapse things. Electrons don't collapse things. So you know, then we have to this ambiguity problem, and this is called the measurement problem. What exactly counts? as a measurement. Well, this is actually a little bit too quick. This isn't quite right. We actually have a question that comes out first. <clears throat> Was it due to the measurement? Is the collapse due to the measurement? Well, in that case, we have this box to answer. What special magical properties do measurements have that make collapse happen? If it's not due to the measurement, well, then it's due to something else. This leads to a class of theories called dynamical collapse interpretations. Theories. GRW is the most famous. Girardi, Remini, Weber uh, initiated this in like the 70s, I think. Um, the idea is there's some mechanism that's just spontaneously making quantum systems collapse when they have too many degrees of freedom of thinking not due to measurement. And this is an active area of research. Some models of dynamical collapse theories have been ruled out experimentally. Some are still viable, but they're complicated. They've got lots of ad hoc constants and parameters in them. I'm not particularly moved by them, but your mileage may vary. Okay? So these are the possibilities. Either it was due to the measurement, and the measurements have some magical properties we have to answer, or not due to the measurement. Now, there is a side problem, separate from measurement problem. Even if we know exactly what a measurement is, here's another question you could wonder. Remember, I said that we talked about this happening. What's happening in the you know, axioms is unitary evolution for undisturbed systems or measurements. Well, what about everything else? Like birds foraging? Well, so people falling in love. What about early gases mixing in the primordial of the universe? No observers there. The universe is too hot to have observers. If we're not talking about measurements, can we say anything at all is happening according to the axioms? So the axioms give us the resources to say that anything else is happening. Even if we knew these are measurements, and these are not measurements. So what's being measured typically? Is it uh, the states of electrons that are around atoms? I don't know. The axioms don't say what's typically being measured. The axioms just refer to measurement. Well, what's supposed we, being... Uh... Suppose we solve... The, oh, hello. Yeah. You have above position and momentum and energy. So you have some specifics. Those things, but there could be other things. This isn't an exhaustive list. Not an exhaustive list. I don't know what, what exactly what a measurement is, what counts. I mean, that's a measurement problem. But suppose we solved it and we said, okay, these things are measurements. When you a person comes along and measures electrons, that's a measurement. We know that. Okay, then what? Right. So is that typically what these axioms are talking about? Yeah. There is measurements of electrons around atoms? Or observation I mean, what of you, I'm looking at you, photons are bouncing off of you, or whatever. Photons, then. Photons, I mean, all kinds of stuff. We, we, we so, know some things are... I mean, photons are generated by uh, electrons and atoms moving between discrete orbitals. So are, are, are the um, discrete 
the um, eigenvalues of this matrix somehow parallel with the uh, discrete energy levels of, a, of an electron around an atom as dictated by spherical harmonics, let's say? Uh, there's not a precise correspondence between the eigenvalues of the one and the other. Okay. Energy levels versus other things. For example, energy could be quantized, but position not quantized. The electron position is not quantized, but uh, energy levels are. Um, my larger question is just when, if you're an early universe astrophysicist and you are writing a paper saying, I believe that when the universe was 500,000 years old, after the last scattering surface, after you know, the universe became transparent in light, I believe that there were electrons bouncing off photons and doing this particular thing. Or I believe that before the last scattering surface, when the universe was so hot that it was a plasma and opaque to light, I believe that there were, that gases of hydrogen were mixing in a certain way with gases of uh, primordial helium or something like that. Can you say those things according to these axioms? Do these axioms give you the resources to talk about that happening? It's interesting that we're renormalizing after each measurement. It's almost like we're treating, I feel like it's like we're treating the observers like classical uh, systems rather than quantum systems mm -hmm. if we're doing that renormalization. We're treating the observers like classical systems. So uh, you're not unique in this point of view. Uh, around this time, there was an interpretation of quantum theory that developed and uh, developed significant purchase over the minds of many of the people working in quantum mechanics. It became known as the Copenhagen interpretation. The Copenhagen interpretation is often uh, uh, confused with the orthodox textbook axioms. But the Copenhagen interpretation was a, was a specific interpretation. It said, observers are classical. And if you want to hear a concrete statement of this, you can read uh, a chapter called the Copenhagen interpretation in Heisenberg's 1958 book, Quantum Mechanics, uh, sorry, uh, Physics and Philosophy. Um, Heisenberg didn't start out very philosophical, but he became very philosophical. He read a lot of philosophical works. There's a lovely interview in the early 1970s with the Canadian broadcasting company uh, in which he talks about his friendship with Wittgenstein and his confusion trying to get through the Tractatus. And anyway, so he, he became more philosophical. But he wrote this chapter in this book, 1958, called The Copenhagen Interpretation, which he laid this out. But you see it's laid out by other people. Uh, Anton Zeilinger gave a talk at Harvard, the annual Lee Historical Lecture. And an hour and nine minutes in, at the end of his talk, he says, here's what I think about quantum mechanics. And he lays out the Copenhagen interpretation. So there's still people who believe it today. The Copenhagen interpretation says that observers are classical. There is classical reality. That is the reality in which we live and which we think and our brains can only understand things that are classical. And then there is the micro world. And for the micro world, we can say nothing. We don't know what's going on. We can use mathematical tools like the wave function to relate what classical observers will prepare to what classical observers will see. But the wave function doesn't have any physical meaning other than simply relating classical preparations to classical results. Now, the Copenhagen interpretation is a giant cop-out. For one thing, it makes it impossible to explain how the classical world could emerge from the micro world. It, because it simply presupposes the classical world as an axiomatic ingredient. Everett was very, this is again where Everett is just, he, he says this very clearly both to Bryce DeWitt and in his, uh, in his uh, long form dissertation. If you take on the Copenhagen interpretation, you're just giving up on the idea that we're never going to be able to understand how to get the classical world to emerge from quantum theory if you're just presupposing the classical world. So I, I'm not a fan of the Copenhagen interpretation. Very few people who look at it seriously, I think, are. Although a lot of people will simply say I'm a Copenhagenist because they, don't, they want you to go away. Yeah. Before you said electrons can't make measurements or something. Uh, or can't collapse wave functions. Is that right? I mean, if I consider a particle physics process in which an electron supposedly scatters off of something, and I keep track of the electron and the thing, there's no collapse that happens. I just get entangled wave function. I mean, there's one sense in which what's going on in the e the uh, Bell CHSH example with Alice and Bob that the two particles did bump into each other, and then they were separated, and there was no collapse of them. They remained in some entangled, unitarily evolving superposition. So you're you're latching onto real problems here. Okay. So this is our flowchart so far. Okay. Yes. If there's collapse, we have a measurement problem. Uh, we have all these other phenomena that seem to be happening in nature, like early gases mixing, people falling in love, all that stuff. We think those are happening, but if we take the axioms literally, those are strictly speaking outside the ambit of the axioms. Either we don't believe those things are really happening, or we don't believe quantum theory can describe them, which means we're admitting quantum theory is incomplete theory, 
or we have to argue that somehow they are in fact measurements somehow. Good luck showing that they're measurements. That's a difficult task, okay? We can say maybe in broad terms, maybe they're cut, but like to actually show it, it's very difficult. Um, I call this the category problem. We have this narrow category of measurement related phenomena. We have the much broader category of everything else that seems to be happening in the world around us. And there's a category error of assuming that everything is a measurement or we deny that all those things are happening. And you could take a very solipsistic view and just say, how do we know anything else is happening? How do we know people are falling apart? How do we know that early gases were mixing? We only know it through measurements. So maybe there really are only measurements. Okay, yes. Can we say that there's no real collapse? That actually what looks like collapse is just, a, you know, unitary evolution. What's your name? Jean Bourne. Jean, yeah, you're anticipating, well, this is a flowchart. We said yes, but we're done with yes. Now it's time to say no. What if there is, in fact, no collapse? So really, what's happening is that the, what we call the observer and the observable and the observed system actually are described by one big big wave function, you know, and that's that's the truth. And you know, three, four, five were just rough approximations. So let's just, let's take what you just said, but because I'm a pedantic, rigorous philosopher, right. I'm going to precisify it. Okay, because people just say this and they either we're gonna we're gonna be no one's gonna be able to escape my flowchart <laughs> in my flowchart. So no, no collapse, no collapse. Okay, now we have a question, follow up question. There was not collapse, despite there not being a collapse. Was there in fact a definite result of the experiment anyway? Was there still an actual, definite, unique result of the measurement? Who says yes? Who says no? What do you think? If you generated information, then you made a measurement. What do you mean generated information? Well, that that would be, are you bringing in a word that isn't in any, anywhere in your axioms, but Right. You know, uh, I guess I would say the definition, which is perhaps circular, is that a measurement generates information and information defines whether something is or isn't a measurement. That's well, literally circular. What exactly. if we were able to like have an apparatus that measured the whole wave function instead of just sampling it? At measured the whole, what do you mean measure the whole wave function? The axioms don't talk about measuring a wave function. They talk about measuring an observable. I think that violates no cloning theorem. Oh, and also, but yes, yeah, well, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, but that, that's that's true. But this is an inevitable consequence of the axioms. The no cloning theorem was proved in well. There are arguments over whether it was some early no cloning arguments, but these, usually people assume that it was proved by Zurich and Wooters in 1982, and simultaneously by a philosopher of physics, uh, uh, Dennis Deeks, also in 1982. But that's it's that follows from yes, the no cloning theorem is a formalization of this fact. You can't scan a wave function. Wave functions are not directly observable. Okay. So was there in fact still a unique measurement? If there is a unique measurement, it is somehow not reflected in the wave function because the wave function has collapsed. The wave function is not collapsed. It's some weird, funny superposition. If you have a weird, funny superposition and one of those is the real outcome and the rest are not, well, then the wave function is incomplete. So if you say yes to this, then the quantum state is incomplete. And this means you've got what are called hidden variables in your theory. And hidden variables theories are many. There are Bohmian mechanics or the de Broglie-Bohm theory. There's the modal interpretations of which there are many and arguably Bohmian mechanics is a special case of modal interpretations. There is the indivisible theory. The theory, indivisible theory. Which we want to hear about. Which we'll get, yes, right. Yeah. Uh, there are very other possibilities. This is the hidden variables argument. And there's a lot of debate starting going all the way back to von Neumann, even earlier, but in particular surrounding Bell's theorem about whether hidden variables theories are viable. That's the thing that uh, hopefully we'll talk about. So that's if you say, yes, there was a definite outcome. If you believe that the quantum state did not collapse and there was not a definite outcome, no definite outcome. Well, then you can ask some more questions on the run out of space pretty soon. One possibility is that uh, there were many outcomes. 
like every superposition branch was many outcomes. This leads to the many worlds, MWI, the many worlds effort interpretation with all of its problems, the probability problem and all the various things. You could say, well, maybe there's like a result, but it depends on perspective. I heard perspective mentioned in cubism. Cubists like the perspectival thing, right? These are called perspectival interpretations. The perspectival interpretations, these include, depending on one's view, cubism, although it's sort of complicated because I can't get Chris Fuchs to agree. Right. I would have said the collapse. Yes, I don't go no. You don't go no. Um, <laughs> relational quantum mechanics is perspectival, and there is growing among some quantum gravity people connected with Lenny Susskind, uh, stemming all the way back to black hole complementarity, this a similar kind of perspectival interpretation. Um, so there's, could it be perspectival, depending on one's perspective, perspectival or relational. And the relational interpretations say that to Wigner's friend, there was a definite result, but to Wigner, there was not. It, like whether there was or wasn't is perspectival. And I'm not going to be able to talk about perspectival interpretations. There are a number of them. There are some pluses to them and some minuses. One is just, what the hell do you mean to say that it depends on perspective whether there was an outcome or not, but there are more sophisticated arguments. Uh, and then the final answer is, there were just no outcomes at all. I guess we have to include that. And this leads to anti-realism and self-undermining, because if there were no outcomes, then there were no measurements, and then there was no science, and then there was nothing. So... Pick your place. Where do you live on this flowchart? Everybody should take a stand. Here we go. You ready? Here we go. Uh, in double boxes are the terminations, okay? So everywhere you see double boxes, we have terminations. This is a double box. Dynamical collapse theories. Uh, collapse due to measurement. That's a double box. Uh, we have hidden variables approaches. That's a double box. We have many worlds. We have perspectival, and I'm not going to ask anyone no outcomes because if you believe that, you're not, you're not in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Who says this box? I have a question about that box, though. Yes. Collapse. <laughs> Are you assuming quantum state is a physical thing? That I didn't say it was physical. Okay, so just that it collapses. Just whatever that we're supposed mean, to collapse, whatever, whatever that means. Okay. Yep. That okay. So okay. we got, oh, we got, got a person here. I, mean, I thought you did say something about collapse. You said that that meant that under unitary evolution, forward from that time that you would find the same result. Oh, I did say you'd find the same result, but the question was, am I treating the quantum state yeah. like a physical object? Yeah, oh, like okay. when he says collapse, is there something? Say that, no, nope. yeah. um, maybe yeah. you have to define collapse I'm, be then. Okay. I'm being very, very careful in yeah. my words. So we have one person for this. Who is hidden variables? Okay, who is many worlds? Who is perspectival? And who, well, no, I'm sorry, you don't get to vote because you don't exist. <laughs> All right, you have to live somewhere in this chart and you'll notice that this is a real problem. Like this, you have to pick a place. When I give talks, before I used to give this flow chart, people would wave their hands and they would dodge and leave. When you show this chart to people, everyone's got to take a stand. You got to be somewhere in this chart. Did anyone not raise their hand? Steven doesn't have to raise his hand. Everyone no, I, I, I think, I, mean, I, haven't, I can't unravel where I think I actually am with respect to this. Okay, okay. I think you've already made too many assumptions yeah, in yeah. making this chart. I am assuming the textbook axioms. Yes. And, and I think and that's, crazy. And, and, and totally so crazy. Is, <laughs> is that <laughs> that's all. Right. You have gone, I should have, I didn't, yeah, yeah. I didn't mark the box. The piece of the box. That's good. You're on the chart too. Everybody is on this chart. It is a, it is a, it is a okay, good. cosmic chart. <laughs> there's, 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 there's within the whole, yeah. <laughs> yeah.